Hey, and welcome back to the Piracy Log. Steve and Lisa. How are you today, Lisa? I am fabulous. I'm excited to be part of your show now. Yes, I mean, it's great. You're, you've had a little more free time on your hands, and I know a lot of people want to... They ask me, where is Frontline Lisi? We love her so much. When is she coming on the show? She never comes on the show. And I don't know if you guys know, some of you know, some of you don't. Uh, Lisa is my wife, my lawfully wedded wife. Of almost 16 years. Or should I call you bride? I know you like that word. Uh, you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> Just don't call me late to dinner. <laughs> oh, no, that's my line. So I hope you guys are having a great Thursday. Lisa and I are excited um, because it is... Oh, it's college football! <laughs> now, I must be a lucky man because I actually have a wife that loves football, in particular college football, and your team is? ASU. And, ASU. And they're Sun Devils, and they're playing NAU. Ironically, we're up in Flagstaff tonight, today. And your team? Fresno State Bulldogs, baby. Playing Cal Poly. Cal Poly Pomona or no, San, Luis no, Obispo. San Luis Obispo? Yeah, there's two Cal Polys. There's San Luis Obispo, which is really beautiful. And then there's Cal Poly. Yeah, not so much for me. <laughs> I played there. I played both places, basically. But um, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo is on the coast of California. Beautiful. Um, so, yeah. So we're looking forward to it. I think or, I think for the Bulldogs, I think we're going to get an easy win. You know, Bulldogs are pretty good. They're pretty good. And I think ASU. Sun Devils are going to kick the Wolverines. I think they're called the Wolverines. They're going to. Utey. You're going to kick the cactus out of them. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> All right. So just wanted to go over some of the items of the day here before we retire for the evening and watch our games and cheer our teams on. But uh, piracy log. First thing I want to talk about real quick is that it appears to me that the Business Software Alliance is back. BSA is back. Um, and that's um, bad news for a lot of companies. And why is that, Lisa? Well, because they're out there trying to recoup money from companies that are using unlicensed products, software products. Yeah, that's right. And usually it's Microsoft Office products that is the culprit. And the reason for that is, you know, when you have this office suite, you usually you buy a, a suite and there's different product suites you can buy. But, you know, it may come with six individually, six or seven individually copyrighted programs like Excel and Word and Outlook, PowerPoint, OneNote, those kinds of things. And when they find an infringement of their suite, they don't treat it as a, an infringement of the suite. They treat it as an infringement of all six different products. And so if you have 10 employees and you're not using licensed software, you know, you're basically looking at 60 or 70 different infringements that they're going to be alleging. And trust me, folks, these um, damages, these demands, they come in, the, in not, not the 20,000s. They usually come in 100, 200, 400. Uh, we've, I think we've seen an offer up to a million. A million, so. yep. Well, and, and also what's interesting with Microsoft is in their EULA and user license agreement, which we all sign when we purchase the software, um, in order for them to say you have valid software, you have to show that you purchased it. You have to have a receipt showing you actually purchased it. Otherwise, they don't count it as a valid license, which is they're the only ones that do that for the most part. Um, so note yeah. yourself, keep your receipts whenever you buy software. Yep, it's a good point. And so, you know, in this, I tell people right now, because, uh, you know, the, the Business Software Alliance, they were really around very aggressively a couple of years ago. And then when the pandemic hit, um, they were gone, like simultaneous with the, the pandemic. They were literally just stopped. And I think it was maybe they just wanted to, um, you know, give companies a break or something while everybody was going through this, you know, health crisis around here. And so uh, they were gone, but it appears I'm just getting signs now that they're they're coming back out of hibernation. And so again, good time to self audit your company, take a quick look, see where you're at, check, make sure you have receipts. Another very important issue is make sure you're not using 
uh, personal software for commercial purposes. Now, you may say, that's totally ticky-tack. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. I wish I was. But if you're using personal products and you're using it for your business, they will give you grief over that if you can believe it. Well, and what's confusing is when you log into your Microsoft or your Outlook or whatever, they'll ask you, personal or work? They call it personal or work which is confusing because it's almost like it's one in the same. So, and now I will tell you, there has been many companies that, believe it or not, the IT department went out and bought student versions and installed them on 200 computers. And I mean, it sounds bizarre, but it it's out there. Yeah, so student versions is obviously another one. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to give the piracy log alert on BSA software audits if you get what we call the love letter you can try to handle it yourself but i will tell you having handled you know a couple hundred of these cases they're not easy it took me a long time to really get it figured out and streamlined and but if you don't know what you're doing or if your attorney has never handled a case your corporate counsel it is wise to seek specialty counsel as i would refer to myself okay so yeah that is the piracy log alert number one well, I've got something. Did, oh, yeah? Did you know that Paramount is suing Triller for breach of contract? And I guess apparently they, I guess they owe them millions of dollars in back, uh, uh, do, um, what do you call it? Uh, they, they owe them millions for, I guess they pay them for their... Royalties. Thank or... you. Thank you. Thank you. That big <laughs> word. That big word. I know. It'd be tough sometimes. So interesting because there's a, that isn't, I mean, Triller, why would it just be Paramount? Why? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen the case. Okay. You should probably send it my way. Okay. It's interesting though because I know uh, Triller, I thought they were the uh, copyright golden child. They were out suing other companies for infringement of their exactly. content and here they are being, no, I'm not saying the case is valid or not. I don't know. I haven't seen it, but it sure is interesting. And you know, it's funny. I get, I, I deal as a piracy attorney. Uh, I deal with a lot of big movie studios and things like that, and it's always funny. But they're, they'll, they'll, your client's a bad person, you know, this and that. And I go, oh, that's funny. I just looked up, and your company was being sued too. Um, boy, I guess your company's bad. My clients are bad. I guess everybody's bad, you know? Interesting. Yeah, I know. It's the, it's the, the uh, IP world, isn't it? IPTV world is kind of seems like it's kind of picking up and little bit on the booming side oh yeah i mean the stuff that we deal with with the mpa motion picture association the ace alliance dish nagra star you know there's so much going on the people intercepting signals stealing content reselling content yeah it's a big deal um i think it's getting bigger i can't tell 100 percent for sure but yes, they are out. They do aggressively enforce their TV shows. If you're pirating TV shows, um, you know, sporting events, things like that. Or you're, another one that, that's popular is, is broadcasting boxing fights without uh, the boxing license, the commercial boxing license. Okay, so, and, and we handle a lot of those cases. And it's interesting because, um, you know, the reality is most of the time it's a customer that comes in with a fire stick or something and plugs it into the TV so they can watch the fight because the fights are expensive and a lot of the establishments don't want to purchase the fights because they're a thousand dollars plus. And so, you know, they don't do the fight and then somebody comes in and says, well, I want to watch the fight. Here, I got my, I got my fire stick. And a lot of times the owners don't know what's going on. They're not, they're not the ones doing it, but they're the ones that get in trouble. Yeah, or the owners are not even physically there. They're, they're like, there. you know, why? I had no, no clue. So yeah, those, those can be, uh, again, those are big cases. Um, we call the we call it boxing piracy cases, but it's really some some call it TV signal piracy. You know, getting channels, but yeah, I mean, if you're going to get a fight, and if it, you know, it's one of two things: if you can't afford the commercial license, if you can't make it work, um, you know, don't show the fight, plain and simple. And they will also investigate because maybe someone down the block, another, let's say, a sports bar is paying for the fight and then somebody finds out that your company or your restaurant your bar is showing the fight and you have no license 
they say, well, that's not really fair. We paid a license and now they're going over to their uh, establishment and, you know, they shouldn't even be allowed to. Anyway, so it becomes that kind of thing. And, you know, these these companies will get aggressive. You have uh, J&J. Uh, you have uh, G&G Closed Circuit, Johan, you have Johan, Johan Promotions, J&J Sports. So, um, yeah, so there's, it's, it's a lot of piracy going on in this world, folks, I tell you. And really, it's because of money and, you know, you know, it's, you know people want to make money and they don't always want to pay what are, you know, can be pretty big commercial licensing fees. And the demands can be very, very large when you get a letter from a law firm uh, you know, it's don't expect it to be, you know, 50,000, you know, maybe 30, very little, very, very few do we see 25,000. But that's, those are the demands that we see when we get retained by a, a restaurant establishment that showed the fight that didn't have a commercial license for it. So piracy log update number two, Dish Nagra Star and TV boxing piracy on the move. So yeah, piracy is, uh, you know, there's uh, some people ask me, well, what do you do, uh, Attorney Steve? Like, what, what kind of law do you practice? I said, well, you know, there's uh, companies all have a department called anti-piracy. So I do the opposite of anti-piracy. I do piracy. <laughs> <laughs> so I always tell people, they say, what? I say, well, do you know anybody that does piracy law? And they say, well, what no. Is and I what said, is it? I'll say, well, that's why it's a good business I'm in. <laughs> exactly right. Um, and I don't know if you knew this, the Ninth Circuit just says that copyright plaintiffs can reach back more than three years in seeking their infringement damages. So that's the Ninth whoa. Circuit. Whoa. Yep. Are you saying, whoa, you're going to have to send me that because are you saying that they're extending the yes. statute of limitations, that I have to read. It says under section 50B, 507B on the United States Copyright Act and infringement claim isn't timely filed unless it's commenced within the three years. Well, the Ninth Circuit just said that you can actually go beyond the three years for your damages now. Oh, well, it's probably if you're, it's probably if, it's probably still the three, I'm just guessing, it's probably still the typical three year statute of limitations. But I think what they're saying is if you're within the three year statute of limitations, you can probably go back eight, 10 years for damages. That's so, what, yeah, for the yeah, yeah. Can you send me that case? Yeah. I, I want to do a blog on that case because yeah. that's a, a really important. Fine. Good, good sleuthing, Aunt, uh, sweet Lisi. <laughs> You're going to call me Aunt Front, Lisa. <laughs> Frontline Lisi, Aunt Lisi, everything. So, um, and this woman can cook, let me tell you. She is uh, <laughs> she is quite the cook, quite the cook. So, um, so next I want to talk about a new California law. It's, uh, have you heard of cyber flashing? Uh, I think I heard briefly you talking to somebody about it. So what is exactly is it? Well, I guess the name kind of tells you, right? Yeah. So um, do you remember we knew that person? I asked him, I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but uh, a person I asked said, how did you and your wife meet? And he said, well, I, I sent her a, a picture of my privates, let's say. And I was like, what? Like I texted her a picture of my privates. And she liked it, and we ended up getting married. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> wow, what an introduction! Yeah, yeah, it's not. You know, Lisa and I met at a software company. We were both uh, workers at a dot com. You know, hi, you know, software, yeah. you know. So, but you know, it was a very credible way to meet somebody. But nowadays, apparently, um, there's other ways to meet people. And it's to send them unsolicited sexual content dealing with your let's just call it your privates okay well here's a question for you because i know somebody that she's in her 50s and she's on some dating site i don't know which one it is but in order because she's in her 50s in order for most guys to go out with girls they want to see a nudie picture of them so that would not constitute that then right well, correct, and, and uh, that's because you're consenting to it. Okay. It's the unsolicited ones, and you know. So there's a lot of, as they say, a lot of younger girls in the. In t t what I'm hearing is in the eight to eighteen category. Jeez. You know where, you know, people are just sending unsolicited. Hey, want to hook up? You know this kind of stuff. So there is California is putting their foot down, putting the putting the gavel down, putting the legislation down, saying you know this is improper and it's a form of cyber harassment. 
is, is the way they're looking at it. So, Well, it's interesting. There is a movie called The Most Hated Man on the Internet. And I wonder if they did, they did pass this law because of this guy. It's on Netflix. I think it's called The Most Hated Man on the Internet. He has a website where people can post nude pictures of, of not just women, but men too. And then people can make comments and then he gets their contact information. He shares it. He shows their home address, their email, their phone numbers. It's, pr- I didn't finish watching the movie, but it's pretty interesting. I wonder if because of, you know, something like that, the, the guy's ruining people's lives. Hmm. I mean, they're being harassed. They're being, you know, hounded at their house. It's, it's pretty, and it was, it, I, like I said, I think I watched half of it, but I mean, I'm glad that there's a new law because there, a lot of that stuff is going around and it's kind of gross. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's gross and it's, you know, it's, again, it's a form of harassment. E- even just all the text messages in general, getting all these unsolicited text messages, you know, and there are there are laws, telephone, uh, Telephonic Con- Consumer Protection Act that, that you can actually, if you can find the person that's sending you, that's always going to be the, the trick. If you can find the perpetrator, many times they're masked or... You know, they're, you know, under disguise or in another country, you'll never find them. If you can find them, like un, even unsolicited texts or robocalls, things like that, well, you can seek a recovery. Well, we get a lot of um, revenge porn calls where, uh, you know, an ex or some sort has posted videos or, you know, pictures um, of a, you know, a, an ex and, you know, they're just distraught about it. Or there was, you know, people that, you know, go, go do modeling jobs and, you know, they end up, you know, per, you know, convincing them to take off their clothes and then those become public for the world. So there's a lot of stuff out there. It's crazy. Yeah. It's a big cyber world out there. So this law can, you can seek damages. And th- these are good cases where a lawyer such as myself could conceivably take it. If you can find the defendant, if the defendant is located in, in California or directing their activities, purposely availing themselves of California, as we call the minimum contacts, you can haul them in, you can sue them, you can get up to $30,000, 1500 to 30000 But more importantly, you can get punitive damages. That could be literally any amount into the millions or whatnot and your attorney fees. So if you, for the right person, I, and I think some people are going to fall trapped to this early on uh, because it's going to, it's new in its application, but the cyber flashing law, California beware. And if you have that special friend out there, you, you might want to tell them to cool their jets because uh, you got you could have some real legal problems here. So, anything else, Frontline Lisi, on your end of the world? What's what else you seeing here in the IP trenches? Well, I was going to ask you this question. Okay, so and I I so now okay, so you have a singer and they 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 do their original songs, but then you have singers that do remakes. Okay, now. What kind of, do they have to get an approval from the original song or the owner of the song? How does that work? Because it said that Mariah Carey is being sued for, and she's she's sang this song forever and ever, um, um, All I Want for Christmas is You. She's been singing that song for years. She's getting sued right now for copyright infringement. So how does that work? I mean, obviously you'd probably need to read the lawsuit, but, you know, it's it's like... You know, I, I would assume a, a famous singer is not going to go just infringe on someone's copyright and sing a famous song. But like, how many people? There's been hundreds of hundreds of art, artists that have sang that song. It's a that's probably one of the most popular Christmas songs. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there was, for an example, there was a lot of people don't realize this either. The Happy Birthday song right. was copyrighted, but you know everybody sings Happy Happy Birthday. Um, and when you when you're doing it for non-commercial purposes, that's just considered a fair use, mm-hmm. you know. But it's when you do things for commercial purposes that then that's one of the four fair use factors, and then you're gonna you're gonna potentially lose out on a fair use defense. Um, but typically, whoever writes the song, the the composer, the lyrics, um, they hold the copyrights, you know. And the, if a band performs it. They own the copyrights, and so usually there's agreements deciding who owns the copyrights. The copyrights get registered, and then if anybody uh, were to commercially 
uh, you know, reproduce or publicly display their song and, and use it, yeah, that's a copyright infringement. Now, there are ways that you can transform a song. One good example of that was Weird Al Yankovic, if any of you as old as I am, um, as old and as wise as I am, but uh, he used to parody the song. So now if you're parodying a song, you know, like he did like My Sharona, he did My Bologna, do, do, yeah. do, do, do. So it's a, he's doing a parody, and parody is creating a new product. And of course, that's gets mo for the most part going to get you fair use protection. But yeah, and so I'd have to read more about the facts. The facts always matter. But um, you know, if she if she's just seeing somebody else's song who has the copyrights. Uh, but a lot of times, there's people will also sue um, famous singers to see if they can get some money. There was also the Taylor Swift. This is a new one as well. Somebody's a, a poet in Memphis, Tennessee, I believe it is, Tennessee District Court suing Taylor Swift for a swift million dollars for sort of a book uh, album cover arrangement and the use of the word lover and the arrangements. So, you know, and I, I looked at it. If you want if you want to see that case, I did talk about that on my YouTube channel, attorneystevevideos.com. That's attorneystevevideos.com. Um, I did a quick, you can see the, the things that they're saying are copyrighted. And I don't see it me personally, but, you well, know, but people will go after wealthy people. They think they have deep pockets, but they'll fight you. Well, they'll fight you. She's, her claim, her claim as I was reading that today, that she had never heard of this poet. She'd never heard of his poems. She had never, didn't even know who he was. So, well, that's one of the things you have to show in copyright infringement. You have to show that you had access, access to the copyrighted work and that it's substantially similar. So I couldn't tell if there really was access or not, or to me, it just it's gonna fail on substantially similar. But yeah, it could fail on either one. And there is a defense in copyright known as independent creation. If two people on two sides of the world create a very similar song, well, that's just the way it goes. Well, what was the song um, that was, uh, oh gosh, um, uh, Ellen Thick's son. He did that song, and the family of Marvin Gaye sued him, mm. and and they won. And it was just it was a, Marvin Gaye, the, the estate of Marvin Gaye, right, right, yes. Right, right. And I think I think he had to pay him like six or seven million dollars. And then what about um, uh, Katy Perry's um, um, something horse? Black, dark horse. Yeah, dark horse. I think she uh, in, initially she lost. And then I believe she, I think it was reversed on appeal or sent back, but yeah. So I, it was just, it was just one, uh, like a one beat that she repeated and we both listened to it and we're both like, yeah, I guess we, I could hear it now, but like, it's like, gee, like one beat's going to get like you sued. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and again, some people use uh, the courts for litigation to try to leverage a settlement. Because what happens in a copyright case, the winner is going to get their attorney fees. You know, whatever, you know, judge may cut it down or whatnot, but the winner is going to get attorney fees and, and potential statutory damages, royalties, all kinds of things. So, I mean, this is why I love copyright law. It's got a lot of teeth. You got a lot of big companies in the space, software companies, entertainment companies. This is, this is why I love what we do. It's it is it's exciting. It's definitely not a boring. Our, our uh, nephew's just working at a big firm in in San Francisco, and I mean he's got some cool big stuff. capital B capital B, and uh, he he's doing their mergers and their you know his is his is more of the legal like lawyer lawyer stuff where we're our stuff is a little bit more on the fun side I think. Yeah, well, I, I like it because, you know, so we work on the people side. Like, I represent people. So I actually help people, and that's what we love doing. Instead of um, helping corporations make more money, we help get people, bail them out of, out of legal problems at a fair and flat rate in most cases. So, um, but yeah, so um, other things, uh, a couple more things here for our piracy log, and then I gotta get this football game started pregame and you know, have, a little, have a little fun today, the end of the month. It was a really, it was a great month of August, a lot of hard work, a lot of things going on. But uh, did you see, I noticed on, uh, while I was watching uh, the football game, there was a, 
I'm starting to see these counterfeit commercials. Did you see those? I, I didn't notice those. Well, it was where these kids go online and they um, purchase electronics. I think it was like an iPad. They do the Apple products. Apple. Well, it didn't. It did. It was alluding to that. It didn't. It didn't say what it was. It was just some. Um, you know, it was some sort of iPad or tablet, and the, it was a bunch of kids, and they were all excited because they supposedly bought it really cheap, and then they got it home. Everyone's happy as could be. They plug it in, That's right. and then it kind of blows That's up. Right. And That's right. Yep. I remember the thing. So yeah, so, um, and I've seen that a couple times, and I was like, you know, I think maybe there's going to be a growth in counterfeit cases and people pursuing their counterfeit rights. And I was really surprised that I, I, my first question was, who sponsored this mm -hmm. ad? And it uh, turned out it was USPTO, the United States Patent that's and Trademark right, Office. Right. We talked about that. So I was kind of like, that's kind of weird. Um, but counterfeits are, you know, we deal with these cases as well. And it's, you know, people buy things and sell things. And they'll get things on like Alibaba that turns out they're counterfeit and then they make gobs of money like like we've seen people make gobs and gobs of money well and it's interesting, interesting the Alibaba I had a conversation with one of the Apple attorneys and I asked her why aren't you guys going after Alibaba that's where all these people get it and she said Lisa great question I do not know I said that's where I, most of our clients get their products from Alibaba yeah yeah so it's really interesting so um, but so yeah, counterfeits, you got to be careful with those, you know, we handled and I'll give you an example of, of why uh, the a certain manufacturer or company would be upset and that could happen. You buy these counterfeit products. I've been duped a, a 50 times in my life buying a counterfeit Apple uh, chargers and cables and they're really frustrating. You, you go get them at the, at the grocery store and they look real, but there turns out they're not, you know. Been burned on that, but more importantly, we handled um, one or two cases dealing with uh, Dyson hair dryers. I, I have a Dyson hair dryer, so do you, don't so you? Do I? I do too. So that's how, how I get my hair looking so great, in case you've noticed. So, <laughs> and it looks fabulous, by the way. <laughs> He's letting it grow out. He's his our hairdresser said, Steve, you've got a great head of hair. Why on earth do you want to cut it short? Keep it long. Keep it what, what our nephew calls it lettuce in the back, little extra extra hair back there yeah a little lettuce and then <laughs> throw some blue cheese on there and yeah you got yourself a salad wonderful so yeah so it, it's uh but with those hair dryers you know what could happen somebody plugs it in thing blows up burns down a house and then next thing you know um, somebody's going after Dyson saying, hey, don't you guys police your products and this and that. So counterfeits, um, that's another area, piracy log, where we're going to cover more of these cases for you. But um, yeah, you can, we, we d represent, defend people accused of selling counterfeit products. So uh, it's crazy. It's crazy, crazy. Anything else on your end? Well, I just got a retainer in, so I need to get to work. Okay, she got a retainer in, so that's retainer good. In. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with one uh, trademark. And actually, if you want, you want to know what kind of client it is? Yeah, what is it? Nagrastar. Dish Nagrastar. Dish Nagrastar. So, yeah, folks, like I said. Now, um, last one, I'm going to go a little bit off topic with uh, trademarks. It's not really, you know, piracy or anything like that. But uh, just to let you know, I'm going to put some more things about trademark law. I haven't done near enough. I love trademark law. But there's an Olympic athlete. And his name is Usain Bolt, super fast I remember guy. Remember him, real tall. Yeah, oh yeah. Like seven six or something crazy. I don't know how tall he is, but just like a, a Olympic legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just want to talk real quick that he's got this lightning bolt pose when he wins and he destroys all his competition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but when he's celebrating, he does this pose where he reaches his arm out and he makes it look like a lightning bolt. And so he's actually trying to trademark this pose in the form of a logo. So it's pretty cool. Like, I, I don't know if the average person knows that you could trademark protect a pose. Now he's doing it in, like I said, in the form of a logo, which should be fine, should be, uh, should be a slam dunker. And that's to sell, you know, products. He wants to sell, you know, 
jewelry and bags, clothing. You know, I think he also wants to open up like restaurants and sports bars. I hope he's paying for his boxing matches. He better be. If not, we're going to be getting a call from him. Yeah, or he's going to get bolted. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I just wanted to slip that in for you trademark fans. But uh, I love. I love trademarks as well, but hey, guys, I got to run. I thank you all for listening. If you like Frontline Lisi, will you, will you let her know? Because, you know, we really need her voice. And she's, uh, you know, she came up in what, what they call or what they still call a man's world in the software world. I worked for Rockwell, one of the big software companies. And so she's great and my awesome, beautiful, amazing wife. So we're going to go run, watch the uh, football games of our respective teams, and have yourself a great weekend. Make sure to click that follow button so you can get some new updates. And what else? I think that's it. If you need legal help, you know where to find us. On the web at attorneysteve.com. That's attorneysteve.com. The first name in legal services. Got to run. Bye now. Bye.